Good day, everybody. I am Drew Shara Samuel Olutunde, and I work with the Department of Animal Breeding and Genetics, Federal University of Agriculture, Abiyokota, Ogun State in Nigeria. I'm also a postdoctoral fellow at the Department of Animal Sciences, Purdue University, West Lafayette, Indiana, in United States. My area of specialization is behavioral genetics. So I work on the welfare and behavior of turkeys and chickens, and I love these birds so much. So I work on fear, aggression, comfort, and some other behavior. And of recent, I develop interest in chicken and turkey vocalization. So I want to know more about their vocalization. So I want to welcome everyone to Animal Welfare Group Nigeria with acronym AWGN. And this group was funded in 2019. That was uh, four years ago, after a gathering of students and lecturers from the Federal University of Agriculture, Abiyokuta, Okun State, Nigeria. And uh, we have expanded to some other universities in Nigeria. Presently, we have representatives from uh, around 21 uh, universities in Nigeria. And what are the missions of AWGN? When I say AWGN, AWGN is Animal Welfare Group Nigeria. The first mission is to increase awareness about animal welfare and behavior in Nigeria, Africa, and the world at large. The second mission is to foster collaboration and networking among researchers who are in the field of animal welfare and behavior. And the third mission is to educate the public on the importance of animal welfare. So we meet every first and third Wednesdays of the month to discuss issues that are related to animal welfare and behavior. And people from different parts of the world have presented on issues that are related to ethical practices, slothing, fear, stress, cognition, neuroscience, actually practices, one science, big data, behavioral genetics, one earth, and others in animals. And these animals include livestock, wildlife, and fishes. So we are not biased. So we look at wildlife, like stock species and uh, uh, it's sometimes pet animals or, or pets and companion animals. And more than 40 scientists have presented 36 talks on animal welfare and behavior on this group. And today's presentation will be the first in the series of 2023. And today's presenter is Hazim Kejelik, who is an expert in conservation education animal welfare and behavior. And Hazim will be talking on snakes and humans, a twisted relationship in folklore and welfare. Today's moderator is Oluwashin Yasele, uh, who is from Federal University of Agriculture, Abeguta also. So uh, Oluwashin, I would love to hand over to you to moderate. Thank you so much. Thank you so much uh, for the wonderful introduction of the group. And uh, I want to appreciate uh, Azim for you know, uh, presenting on our platform. I want to appreciate everybody for joining us today as today is the first meeting in the year 2023. I'm so excited. We've started again. And um, our presenter is Azim Kejelik. He is a conservation educator and he has devoted his career journey of over 14 years to aspiring positive change and a love for nature in children and adults of all ages and background. During his study at the Biotechnical Faculty in Slovenia, Azim started working in the zoo field as an education officer, teaching school groups, and an education ranger, where he delivers daily animal talks, conservation stations, and behind the scene animal encounters. That is interesting. Soon, his interest in a wholesome approach to Zoo's impact on wider society guided him in actively working in other departments from the presentation team and animal keepers and trainers to design and marketing. Appreciating the role modern zoos play in global conservation, particularly when lecturing about ecology, animal welfare, and behavior, Azim's great passion, now that he's writing his first book, continues to put a spotlight on animals around the world and the important role they play in a healthy ecosystem. 
So uh, permit me to welcome Azim to give his presentation on snakes and humans, a twisted relationship in folklore and welfare. Please drop your questions in the chat box and we'll take the questions immediately after his presentation. At the end of everything, uh, we have the opportunity to discuss uh, with ourselves. So please, I would like to plead that we stay till the end of the meeting because you'll find it interesting. Okay, everybody. Hello and welcome. Yeah, I wonder, I'm sure you were all wondering how to pronounce my name. It is Asim Kerjalic and I originate from Eastern Europe, but has worked across Europe, Australia and UK where I've lived for the last six years now. I am a conservation educator and my great passion and expertise are ecology, animal behavior and welfare. Today, I wanna to talk to you about one of the most amazing groups of animals in the world that sadly are quite misunderstood. So if I ask you or anybody you know around the world, what do you think of snakes? What do you know of snakes? Usually people are gonna give us quite negative things, even though Believe it or not, snakes as a group can be incredibly beautiful. Some would even say cute. Very interesting animals in that come in all different shapes and sizes uh, and are just waiting to be uh, explored and learned about, uh, especially since I believe as a zoo expert that they are one of the strongest animal ambassadors we have out there to teach children and adults of all ages, of all backgrounds and abilities, why we should care, why should we protect nature, why should we protect different aspects of it, including the animals that sadly, despite their brilliance, despite their adaptations, might not have had a fair share of human love compared to, let's say, other groups of animals. And even if we don't talk about mammals or birds, big and fluffy and warm, and then we just focus on the general group of reptiles, even within that group, snakes often are the ones that are the most negatively perceived uh, and prosecuted for it. Why is that? Just like everybody else in their group, they have scales um, that they need to shed, but they do it in one piece, unlike the other relatives of theirs. They also, are able to use their tongue for smelling and put it out of their mouth without, without opening the mouth, which is quite unusual. Uh, and it's only done by a, a few more animals. Uh, and in general, it is also the stare of such an animal because despite them looking like they always are looking at you and have their eyes open, it's quite the opposite. Their eyes are continuously closed. It's because they have a semi-see-through membrane covering their eye and they even shed over their eye. It gives them that classic snake stare. So I want to dive deep today, not focusing on the other reptiles, but just go for snakes and learn a little bit more about them. I'm hoping that at the end of this presentation, we don't need to love them. We don't need to want to be around them. I'm sure snakes don't want to be around us the majority of the time, but I just want to tell you a little bit more about the misconceptions that happened in the past that are, might still be happening around the world right now and how that is affecting their conservation. So as you can imagine, over the, over the many, many th hundreds and thousands of years, snakes have sadly often been uh, portrayed as a dangerous animal. The reason for it is they have been, they look quite different to us. They don't have legs. There's an exception, I'll let you know later. Um, and it's their look, it's their appearance, it's the way they move the way that they don't have ears, the way they don't majority of the time don't produce any sound. All these things are intriguing, but sadly through history in a negative way. I, as an ecologist, see them as a fascinating result of a, millions of years of evolution, but sadly through different cultures around the world, snakes have been portrayed negatively. So even if we look top left picture in biblical uh, stories around it, snake is portrayed as a bad individual and also later cursed to forever drag on the floor legless uh, for the rest of eternity. Medusa with the hair uh, of snakes that turn people into stone and of course different cultures around the world not just the European ones but also the Aztec and all the others. Often snakes are seen as bad because yes there are some venomous snakes in the world. To be fair, there's about 600 species of venomous snakes and about 200 of those are dangerous to humans. 
but there is 200 out of almost 4,000 species of snake that we know of right now exist in this world. So despite the negativity, I am happy to see that every once in a while in different cultures around the world, snake with all its attribution to it is portrayed as a positive animal. For example, uh, in a Chinese zodiac, there is a snake. It represents people that are mysterious, people that are wise, because this is what we get from an animal that isn't seeking our attention, that is minding its own business, that is looking like it's contemplating its own life in the best way possible. And of course, they often, luckily, also represent um, continuous immortality, meaning, you know, start of life anew, because they shed it seems like they're just continuously doing that and living forever. Of course, they do not, but it is a beautiful representation of it. There are also stories in Europe about snake queen with a diamond crown protecting children and keeping them safe from violent adults. So quite an interesting take of an animal that otherwise, or a group of animals, is portrayed very negatively. So we saw the pictures before this slide. They're very beautiful, diverse group of animals. And even as an, anim as an animal expert who worked with them for almost 15 years now, you will not see me just walking towards a snake I don't know. So I want to use this opportunity to talk about how I talk to different audiences, what do they think about snakes and why, and very often why that might not be based on true science. So let's see what we have next. Let's go from, by understanding snakes, we will go from fear to fascination. One of the biggest problems people have with snakes is that they look slimy. But believe it or not, they are not. Even though they look incredibly similar to your amphibians, to your snails and similar animals, they actually do not produce mucus. It's because they're completely covered in scales. They are, how I describe it to the audiences that I work with, whether it's tiny little children, their parents and everybody else, is Look at your fingernails. If you look at them right now and you start moving them around under the source of light, they're gonna shine, aren't they? Why? Because they're made out of the same substance as a snake's uh, scales. So the question will then come from me to you saying, can you sweat through your, through your nails, fingernails? You can't. It's an amazing adaptation, but since snake is completely covered by it, it can't sweat at all, which means it's not slimy. And because of that, it also doesn't have any real smell at all, majority of the cases. Uh, also goes with our hair, same sub -pr principle of shine. Uh, and of course we do not sweat through our hair either, but this is when I connect us again with the animal because we fear what we do not know. We think this is this kind of alien-like animal is so different from us that we couldn't possibly see the similarities. Or we lift ourselves above them with our ego instead of realizing that we are part of nature and with them have our own place in the world. So snakes, believe it or not, because we have hair and produce oils to keep it healthy, we sweat to cool us down and also uh, keep our uh, skin hydrated. Um, snakes can't do any of those things, which means technically humans are twice as slimy as a snake. It's an interesting combination that comes later when we realize, oh, they are not the, the bad one. We are an interesting extreme. They are actually beautifully adapted to keep what's bad on the outside and protect the animal on the inside. An interesting fact that comes with it, they do not shed. Uh, they, they have to shed, they, the, the skin doesn't grow with them, so they have to shed, and they shed in one piece. And with that, believe it or not, to a certain degree, they can heal themselves from parasites who are on their skin, on external parasites, or even make the wounds on their bodies slightly, slightly, slightly smaller and more healed every time they shed. So it's an amazing ability that these animals have that helps them survive in different places. Well, one of the big ones that everybody worries about snakes is the bite. So the reason for it is we have seen it on television. We have heard about stories of people being bitten or read about it in books. Even when you think about most popular books about animal uh, fantasies and similar, snakes are portrayed very negatively. Well, believe it or not, snakes don't want to bite us. They really don't. In majority of the cases, unless it's an extreme uh, size different, uh, extreme size comparison, these animals 
just like to be left alone uh, because if they bite you, there's a giant risk of them injuring themselves. This is the animal that doesn't have hands and arms, so they can't help uh, themselves feed by pushing the food in with their hands. They don't have any. And you're going to notice in the pictures in the middle that these animals have quite a few teeth, anything between 30 in different rows on the upper part of their mouth, all the way to about 300, 400 teeth, depending on the species. And you're going to notice they're all retracted back. And there's a reason for it. Once they grab their prey, this is the best way to make sure that it doesn't escape. And as they slowly open their mouth and make their way forward and pushing the prey in with the head first, always head first, um, it allows them to then swallow it. Why would they risk an injury by biting us? But great majority of the snakes in the world could never do any real damage to us physically, as in with, with their size. So these animals would just want to do a warning, a warning bite, which means stretch forward, bite and release right away. The animal that cannot speak is trying to tell us, leave me alone, I am not comfortable with this, I would like you to go. You are big, you are scary, you could be dangerous. And the individual I'm talking about is human. We are the big, the scary, the dangerous. And these animals don't want to have anything with us. So if a snake is trying to bite someone, very often it's a mistake. Either we stepped on them and they can't vocalize it any other way that we are hurting them, or they're just trying to keep us away. But they're trying it every possible way to prevent injury. So they don't want to be biting left or right. So even with the snakes that I usually work in the classroom, your classic pythons and corn snakes, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about them later, if they bit at my hand and hit any of the bones in our hand, and you know there's plenty of them in there with the knuckles and everything, they could injure their teeth and they could have trouble eating and with it, trouble surviving. So these animals do not want to bite us. They are not coming after us to bite us. And this is where our next perception comes as well. It is the amazing snake tongue. We have all know about it, we all heard about it. It is that classic split like a fork at the tip and they have a special little slit at the um, bottom of their mouth that allows them to take it out and in uh, without opening their mouth, which is quite a rare adaptation in animal kingdom. Now, why do they do that? Believe it or not, their eyesight is horrible. Remember what I said before, snakes have eyes continuously closed. They are covered with semi-see-through membrane, uh, a scale, which allows them to see, but only for about 25 centimeters. So it's basically the palm of your hand, maybe two palms of your hand, and that's it. They live a very blurry, foggy light, but don't worry about them. They are beautifully adapted to know exactly what's happening around them. First of all, they have a flat belly and they're usually long animals, which means Despite not having external ears, they can feel the vibration that's coming through their belly and also their lower jaw and allowing them to know where, how big and how fast something is coming towards them. Also, because they have horrible eyesight, they need to rely on other senses. And one of the most brilliant ones is smell. But despite a very, very tiny percentage of it actually coming from the nose, they do have the two nostrils, uh, it's actually the help of their tongue that allows them to smell. So here we have a brilliant uh, presentation of a snake tongue doing its job, which is coming out. It is not here to lick us. It is not here to touch us with it. They're flickering it around and picking up uh, particles uh, of smell that are in the room. This is what you're gonna see when you work with snakes and you come into a room with a lot of new people. Snake will suddenly start flicking its tongue around very often and start turning around left and right. Why is it doing that? It's basically analyzing the room. It's trying to figure out who is in there, how many people, and even if they're dangerous or not. How would they know that? Well, they can smell stress hormones as well. This is where the perception of animals can sense fear. It's not magic, it's actually science. So they are here to analyze their surrounding and find out what is out there. Is it safe to relax? Is it safe to rest? Should they retreat? All this come from there. So once, the reason why their tongue is split into two is because it allows them to sense direction. 
Remember, if you can't rely on eyesight, uh, then knowing where something is, the direction wise, is very important. And because their tongue is split, and uh, it can pick up different smells on different halves. And once it goes in their mouth, like we see on the bottom picture, it enters a Jacobson organ at the top of their mouth cavity, which then allows it to analyze what's on it. The smells that are now glued to the tongue can now be analyzed and the direction of prey or threat can be figured out as well. So they will know, for example, something tasty is on the right, turn towards it again, get the tongue out, and now the smell will be strong on both tips of the tongue, which allows them to understand the location of the animal now being in front of them. And of course, let's not forget also the amazing ability for the snakes to sense the heat, uh, have re heat receptors as well to really help them. One big thing that I want to talk about today is snakes and movement. People sadly, either because of folklore or stories of other people, believe that snakes are trying to come after us, that they're trying to chase after us. Please understand that that is not a thing. The reason for it is the one that I mentioned before. Snakes don't want to do much with us. Despite them being quite long animals very often, which gives us a false sense of their size, we should compare animal size with their head and our head. Snake heads are usually very small. That's the part that can cause most damage but they're very, usually very petite animals. So what is it that we, that we think um, makes them very dangerous? People have told us that they will follow us, that the snake will find you and come after you and want to bite you or your loved ones or your pets. Very often, very, very, very often, majority of the cases, snakes don't want anything to do with us because coming towards us as a giant animal that we are, can put them in harm's way. If we step on them, we can break their ribs. We can even kill them. Snakes don't want to risk that. So you will usually see the snake going opposite direction or be, as we would call it, frozen, meaning that by accident, you stumbled upon a snake on a path or somewhere in a road. That snake doesn't want to be there with you, which means you just, um, suddenly appeared and the way you react is how they will react as well. If we just leave them be and walk around with a big, big circle away from them, they will just, once we're done and they don't feel our vibration, will continue moving away where they, were, where they were going. Snakes do not want to move towards us. And maybe even an interesting one here that we see, their movement is fascinating. It is sadly, for many people, one of the reasons they don't like them. They don't seem to have any legs, which means they are slithering around using their muscles. They're contracting at different parts of their body and also scales that are long and flat at the bottom of their uh, stomach. So this allows them to move. And this particular animal living in desert is portraying one of the most extreme ways of movement when it's trying only to touch certain parts of the surface, which are very hot at this time of day, and uh, to make sure that it doesn't overheat. But in general, what is happening with the snakes is this. We're gonna see the little footage on the left of a snake that is trying to hide itself, which is one of the best ways to avoid uh, being eaten and also wait for your prey. And of course, the picture on the right is how I would usually see a snake. Snakes love small spaces. Snakes love to hide in them because it allows them to feel safer. Why? Because if you're in the open, in the middle of a field, in the middle of a classroom, anything can hurt you from above and from the sides. But if you squeeze in a small crevice, which is what their evolution worked towards, it allows them, because they're legless, to go into small spaces and hide there, you will feel the pressure of, uh, of the walls from the sides and above, and knowing that danger can't come from that side, which means snakes can feel more comfortable knowing that the only direction they need to focus on is the one in front of them, the one where the head is, so they can defend themselves, but only from that angle. They are safe from the top, they're safe from the side, they're safe from the back. That's what these animals seek. Now, an interesting one that also we don't understand is snakes, uh, when it comes to their adaptation that they have, 
I wanted to use this one. I found it on the internet, uh, but I have worked with snakes like these. Believe it or not, some of them do have, in a way, legs. Not the real legs like we would ex expect from um, a lizard or a similar animal, but it is the remaining bones of their back extremities, and they're right next to a cloaca. For anybody who's joining us doesn't really know much about reptiles, cloaca is going to be the exit uh, where they lay eggs to empty, so they get rid of all the things through that one little hole that at the moment is on the left side of this lovely little bone, uh, and it's closed because usually they only defecate once a week or even less. But anything that follows that uh, place in the body is the tail, uh, and around there, you would then also see in certain groups like pythons, and even then, only certain individuals, you're going to see that they actually have remainings of their back legs. Another way for us to make snakes fascinating to the children and the adults when we talk about them. And of course, snakes come in so many shapes and sizes and colors. And one of the biggest fascination that is, is some of them are trying to hide from us with the help of camouflage. Some of them are trying to be incredibly colorful to tell us, like the animal uh, uh, in the middle, uh, in the middle uh, that they are venomous and should be left alone. This is a coral snake. And another fascinating one, when you have snakes with adaptations that actually mimic the dangerous ones, mimic the animals that you should avoid for sure, and other animals as well. And this allows them to then uh, be protected by looking the same as them, or in this case, very similar. How does it, if you just look at the coloration and we ignore the yellow and white, they do have a very similar color palette, but the combination of light color touching red and black, well, in the one that's not venomous, is always touching the black and never the red, is for someone like me who adores snakes, an easy way to tell this is the animal that isn't venomous, this is the animal that has perfected, almost perfected, its um, uh, mimicry to protect itself. So what do we do? I want to talk to you about snakes in the classroom. I have been as a zoo educator working with snakes for almost 15 years now. And I know the question will come at the end, which is how many times have I been bitten in 15 years of working with snakes pretty much every single day uh, of my career? Uh, the answer is once. I have only been bitten once in 15 years by a snake that I absolutely understand why I did it, because she was a very new snake. It hasn't been handled properly by the previous collection and needed a lot of work. And even that, I can uh, we can talk about it in the Q&A later, it was barely anything noticeable. Uh, and I think I hurt more by hitting my hand on the side of the vivarium as I retracted back than the actual bite of an animal. Please understand, when we work with snakes in classrooms, they represent an amazing animal ambassador. They are here to allow us to teach every age group about pretty much anything. One of the bestest and strongest topics we can go to are habitats and adaptations. They live almost everywhere in the world, and they are a very, very diverse group. We can talk about food web. They fit right in the middle. They're a predator animal and a prey animal, which means um, some of their adaptations are there to protect them and hide them from danger, and some of them are there to find them their next meal. We can talk about evolution. Like I said, the fact that some of them still have the remaining parts of their back legs, the fact that um, how they evolved as reptiles, how reptiles have changed little over the millions of years of evolution, everything, ecology, they have an incredibly important role in a healthy ecosystem. And even as we go further into university and college levels, they're amazing animals to work with to learn about animal husbandry and veterinary care. Because if you ask somebody decades ago, how much do snakes really need for their care? Probably not much would be their answer, which of course is very wrong. Just like every other animal from your chicken to your tiger, these animals deserve the best animal welfare. And through uh, experiences and sharing it in conferences and scientific articles, we're learning more and more about them every single day. So this would be my classic classroom on the left side with children in half a circle, or in this case, teenagers. And on the right, if you're wondering what that is, it is a collection of some of our artifacts. We call them bio artifacts. Some of them are replicas, like the big cat skull on the left. The rest are actually real animals. 
Zeus often obtained these from customs. So the police that catches uh, smugglers of wild, illegal wildlife trade uh, at the airports, like the London airport, like the London airports here in the UK, they still seize about one million pieces of these every single year. So either they destroy them, so incinerate them, or they hide them in a giant safe at the police station and it's there forever, or they are donated to educational organizations like modern zoos. So we can help children learn about these animals and what we can do better, that we do not need a giant caiman stuffed on our, and placed on our table in the dining room, or that we don't need, for example, a rock python skin that you can see at the bottom turned into fashionable accessories. So snakes are very, very often targeted because of that. Uh, and we're trying to, of course, make sure that people learn about them and understand it more. So if I want a snake in a classroom, I also need to understand how to work with a snake. So snakes, like I said, are a brilliant animal ambassador when it comes to teaching about pretty much anything. But one thing that I do understand is the fear of snakes. I come from a country where snakes are deemed as very negative in, to the point of religiously persecuted uh, and need to be killed. Killed with a shovel, killed with a rock the second they see. These animals don't deserve that reputation. Like I said, they're an incredibly vital part of a healthy ecosystem and they do not seek our co co contact. They do not seek our attention. Wild snakes do not want to be with us uh, and they want to stay far, far away. So if I am allowed to bring a snake in a classroom, please know it is always gonna be an animal that I know as an individual. And have every single aspect of their animal welfare has been considered as well. As we go with down, uh, down line with the presentation, you're going to learn about every single step that needs to happen for me to get a snake into the classroom and how that is monitored. So these brilliant animals, because of their bad reputation, but on the other side, amazing adaptations, are incredibly, incredibly important live animal. Now, Artifacts, bio-artifacts you saw in the previous slide with the tusks and the skins and the skulls are a brilliant way for us to engage with audiences and allow them to learn about, oh my goodness, a tusk of an elephant can be three meters long. Oh my goodness, I didn't know that a turtle shell is this heavy. But on the other side, sometimes we can and do bring live animals into these presentations as well. The easiest way to do it is, of course, with the help of the invertebrates. It's your classic Madagascar hissing cockroach, stick insect, and um, snails. But then, as you go up and up and up, you realize that if you do know how to work with reptiles, they become an invaluable animal ambassador that allows you to create the bridge between the children's current not understanding of them, but they're very curious about it, and on the other side, their desire to protect them. So if I was opening a classroom right now and finding a space when I can teach that involves snakes, I would go for these three species. The one in the top and the middle is your classic royal python or bull python. They got their name because when they're resting, they actually uh, shape, go uh, rest in the shape of a bull with their head hidden inside. So even if a predator in the wild would find them, they originate from Egypt, they would be bitten on the outside part of the body, so the animal would have time to put their head up, a uh, head out, and bite back to protect itself. But yet, other than that, it will nothing else to do with anything else but uh, rest and find food. And you can even see perfect amazing camouflage that allows it to hide. Now, if you look at the previous paragraph, with it's similar here. These animals have lovely camouflage at the top, but very wide bellies at the bottom. Two reasons for it. Reason one, other animals don't really often see that body part anyway, so it doesn't need to be camouflaged, so they're still hidden. But since some of them are arboreal and semi-arboreal, meaning they like to climb trees to get to some food or avoid danger, their white, be their white bellies allow them to blend in with the bright uh, sky light, uh, so they are to a degree hidden. It's called counter shading in many species, including penguins, orcas, but it also can be seen in animals like these. The other one, bottom left, 
is a corn snake. More energetic, faster animal, but come in, uh, but it's smaller, thinner, and longer. Um, these animals are the ones that I met as a child, and they come in an array of different colorations. Uh, they originate from North America, and believe it or not, they're incredibly important for helping agriculture because even though they originally lived in the forest, and of course some of them still do, when people started destroying their habitat to create crop fields, they actually adapted. So they're not specialists like some animals. They actually were able to adapt to the change and start living in the cornfield. And there they are eating mice and smaller rats and other animals that are actually destroying the crops. Uh, so in a degree, to a degree, they are helping us get our food. And of course, the one on the right is the one that I mentioned before. It is going to be your classic milk snake, which is very similar to a to your um, a coral snake, but it's not venomous. And you can see that the pattern is slightly different. So if I had to put these snakes in the order of preference when it comes to how easy and I'm going to use air quotes friendly they are to work with, I would say that royal pythons are the number one winners for sure. Corn snakes would go second. And then milk snakes would go third. Why? They're incredibly fast animals. You have to be very sure of how you're working with them. Uh, so they're very, very fast. They react very quickly. Uh, and only staff that have experience working with snakes and only older children uh, should be handling these animals. Again, there's no real reason for these animals to be biting anybody or harming anybody, but their presence alone for somebody who might not be so sure of snakes or even despise them and fear them greatly, this animal would not be a good animal ambassador because it moves a lot compared to, let's say, the python at the top and uh, that doesn't do that often. And another one incredible fact that comes with ball pythons, despite them being pythons, they don't grow to be five, six meters tall or uh, long. They actually are about 1.2 meters long and when weigh one and a half kilos. So they're very small uh, animals and very slow moving animals. So by knowing their ecology, it also allows us then to utilize that when it comes to people meeting them. So before we even start, if I want to teach children about snakes, if I want to teach the society about why not to fear snakes, we want to make sure that we reach the animal welfare standards that are suitable for these animals. As decades go by, we are learning more and more about what these animals need. This is not what we want. This is what was used to be perceived as good enough for snakes, which means one hideout, bowl of water, just for drinking, can't even go in there. Uh, very simplified lighting, UV system, if even. And that's it. We don't want that. So even as we were remodeling our discovery center where I worked, we were building towards having enclosures that were three, four times bigger and even taller uh, compared to where the animals would used to be housed some years ago. So what we're doing is finding species that live in a particular way. For example, if they climb, they should have a vivarium space that allows them to climb as well. If they don't, then maybe longer vivariums that allows them allow them to stretch out completely. Please know that these things are continuously updated and every modern zoo in the world has to pass licensing inspections. These also include measurements and every other a husbandry uh, uh, information that you need for snakes. Uh, and if these are not met anymore, let's say that the vivarium is now too small uh, to what we now know of this snake's needs, we will actually then uh, have to build a new one, buy a new one. You are not allowed in modern zoos to display any of your animals if you don't reach the minimum requirements for this particular species. Whether you're talking about tigers, the size of their enclosure, the height of their fence, um, the separation of, bit of options in the indoor enclosure, or you're talking about snakes, standards are very high. And of course, what you want to create out of this is your mini ecosystem, a place where your snake can feel safe when your snake can have all its basic and advanced needs met. Because one thing we always forget about snakes is because they are so usually very calm, they don't move as much, and we also think they don't need much. That's actually not very true. Snakes 
are complex animals and their welfare is important. So even just by doing the simple things like creating different hideouts, finding a hot spot in the enclosure, a cold, uh, colder spot, because they do not have steady body temperature like we do, they need to regulate it with the help of the external factors. So including snakes having drinkable water and also having a place where they can go in this water because it allows them to, with the humidity, to prepare for shedding. So all these things are going to be noticed. One of the big things that I need to consider if I want to have snakes meet children is that the snakes don't see my hand as a source of food. So if I am to feed a snake, I am not opening the vivarium and feeding them inside there. I will take the snake out and put it in a special box with a lid and then put their food in there. Certain parts of the world allow animals like mice to be fed as a live prey, but in the UK where I am from that, uh, right now, that is not a case. So we feed them mice that were humanely put to sleep. So a snake will then eat the animal that was placed in there with a the help of a grip. So it's a long meter long handle that allows me to put the uh, food in there and let the snake grab it and then swallow it head first. I will then give it some time because it does take some time, even a couple of hours for the animals to uh, um, swallow the prey and then start uh, pushing it down their uh, digestive system. So we can then later safely pick it up and put it in the vivarium and leave it in there for about three days before it has uh, passed the meal onto the other side in form of a very, very smelly and usually very liquid poo on the other side. Now, why is this so important? I want you to understand that when we work with these brilliant animals, everything is logged, everything is monitored. So we are not choosing animals that are in a particularly uh, sensitive time of their life, whether it's shedding, or digesting or incubating eggs or anything like that. How do you do that? Well, one of the best ways to do it is to have multiple snakes. Multiple snakes in multiple vivariums allow us to choose the individual that is the best suited for that particular age group in that particular day so we can work with them safely. Now, believe it or not, one of the biggest issues that snakes can have in captivity is obesity. And of course, that's something we do not want. So not only do you allow them, like in the enclosure on the top left, to have some climbing frames and everything, you can even design enrichment for them, which comes as a huge shock to some people. Because again, like I said, unless it's big and fluffy and warm, uh, you don't think it needs much. Enrichment is for every animal species. Um, it just comes in different levels of complexity and snakes are not that complex, but it can allow them to exercise, get those nice and strong muscles. It also can help them with their digestive system and everything, because if we eliminate obesity, it, uh, it helps prevent many other health problems that can come with it. And this is what we use. Zim's program is uh, our online system, like a library that we and every other modern zoo in the world are using to log everything about every single animal individual that we have, including snakes. What, are the, what is their name? sex when they were when did they hatch who are their parents grandparents and as much info back as we can go with the family tree and then of course did the when did this animal eat how much did it eat one mice two mice one rat uh did it reject food how many times and then we also can start following the patterns all these things put in place allow us to, uh, uh, to give them the highest standards of welfare because these animal, this information will also let us know if the animal is suitable for handling uh, or not. Uh, have we done tests? Does it have a increased presence of salmonella or any other pathogen, uh, which is quite normal to a certain degree in their digestive system anyway? And all of this to keep them safe and us safe as well. So, this is me. <laughs> this is me as I started my career 15 years ago, working with the same snake in both pictures. He's just slightly, slightly darker in the other one because he uh, was on day one of starting to slowly move towards shedding process, uh, which means they change color a little bit. Now, you can already see the one important thing we have to do here is have confident trained staff, people who feel confident working with snakes, and why? So when I started working at the zoo, 
uh, I was at university and they asked me, and I only met a snake once in my childhood in that very zoo, and they asked me, are you afraid of snakes? And I said, I don't know. To be fair, I don't know. I've heard about them. I've read about them. I know what how I should be feeling, but I don't think that is the correct way. So I don't know if I'm afraid of them. So I was introduced to this lovely boy called Rudy. It is a male royal python. Believe it or not, he was found in a bin, which means the trash can. Somebody got fed, uh, fed up with him because, believe it or not, they do live 35 years, uh, these animals in captivity. So they just threw him in the trash. Uh, and Zoo was kind enough to, with the help of exotic pet trade uh, organization, to house this animal. And later he became one of the best ambassadors for children to learn about snakes in a country that is afraid of them, very much so. So Rudy is the one that I worked with in the beginning and throughout, and he's the, always the animal that I chose to help teach other um, colleagues as well about how to work with them. Because he's a royal python, he's smaller, uh, he doesn't move as much, uh, and uh, he has very clear signs, behavior patterns that I can recognize, that we can follow to know how he's feeling, when he's suitable ha ha for handling, and when he's not. There we go. So what we do before we even start thinking about bringing our animal into the classroom is choosing, of course, the correct animals. Choosing from the array of species that we have experience with is an important step. And like I said, royal pythons and coal snakes seems to be your number one, number two species to choose from. Now here you see that's not one animal, it's about four of them together. So when we had a clutch of eggs that hatched, uh, with the corn snake uh, infants, they spend a lot of time together, climbing over each other, uh, partially probably from the sense of security as well. And when we started working with them, we realized that one of the best ways to allow them to feel safe when picked up, because we like to start as a young age when it comes to the snake, if we have that chance, is that they seem to do really well if they were together. So I was the only interesting person in my department walking around in the classroom walking around in the snake room with four or five snakes holding them at the same time you allow them to hold on to you to feel safe and what i love about snakes you can even see it on my right arm uh is they create safety bracelets so if you have snakes of this side the medium size snake they actually create a safety bracelet meaning using their back of their like the last quarter of their body to wrap around your hand just in case if you trip if you fall if something comes from the other side if they slip because our skin usually is not the best uh surface for them to grip onto they can hold on and protect themselves so it's an amazing way for them to control a situation to a certain degree the one step that we have, of course, is training staff, training other people, aside from us who work with snakes on a daily basis, how to do it. My colleague in the middle picture never worked with snakes before as a part of their husbandry. He's your amazing expert in giraffes, elephants, and similar large hoofstock animals. But when he was assigned this particular taxa as well, we had to work with him. And he was the one that found me and asked for help and asked for guidance. And this is the most important lesson that I have for today, which is if you ask me for help and you ask me millions of questions that I cannot answer why animal is doing something. Why is that snake twitching? Why is that snake moving its tongue? Why is that snake going away? If I do not have the answer for that, you shouldn't be holding that animal. Because if I do not understand its behavior right now, I don't understand what it's coming after, what it's trying to tell you. Remember, they're not vocal creatures. Their body language and behavior is what we can use to predict what's coming next. So if I, uh, for example, with this amazing uh, young gentleman, it took us less than 10 minutes and he felt very comfortable working with snakes moving them around, which is brilliant. Sometimes it takes two, three weeks with certain people, depending on how strong your fear of snakes is. But like I said, we fear what we do not know. So helping people understand why they do things and how they can help them feel comfortable is the best way to do it. And you can already see here, the animal is using him as a climbing frame. He's holding it evenly on sec uh, second and third third. Uh, so the animal is holding with its tails around its uh, hand, so it has that safety net, and 
has a table, which we don't usually have later, but right now it's a great way to do it, as a surface to rest on. Because believe it or not, snakes don't want to dangle with their heads down. They like to uh, find a surface, like a little pillow, to rest on them. And once we pass that, the best way to do it is that we start training with the help of staff and colleagues that aren't snake uh, experts or snake keepers. So anybody I can find in the zoo that will allow me to practice with them to see how the animals are reacting is a great way to do it. So snakes are not seeking our attention per se, but we can make sure that when we do have them, we're an interesting enrichment experience for them. Especially me, I have very warm hands, which usually comes in very handy for snakes. Uh, and they tend to rest on it a lot, including some other reptiles like bearded dragons. Uh, well, uh, you can also see their reactions when you have other people and how they examine the surface when you have bracelets, watches, cold hands. So this is all also part of an enrichment for the animal as well. And of course, after that, like my lovely nephew here, uh, you are ready to meet snakes. Um, and learn a little bit more about them so we can practice with always adult supervision with the animal we know is suitable to meet a child. So Rudy, a lovely python, was always great at that. Uh, and of course, just like with cats, dogs, and every other animal, it is our responsibility to teach the next generation what behavior is acceptable by them. The pulling, the point, the poking and everything, we don't allow that. We tell the child why we are doing certain things and how they can help. So you can see, because he's sitting down, he has a bigger surface for the snake to rest on. Uh, my brother is holding the front part. I'm holding the back part as well, just so the animal feels supported and we avoid any injuries at all. And after that, it is just observing animal's behavior. And right now, what the Rudy is doing, he's just examining this new person, their smell, their uh, skin and everything and realizing he's in a very safe place. Uh, but even then, I notice very often if you work with snakes and you're um, an adult, um, when you hold them in your hands and they like to climb towards your, um, kind of towards your um, armpits, so towards the part of your body that seems like the entrance into a cave. So it's a combination of your elbow and your armpit and they think there's something on the other side. Why? Because it's their natural behavior to look for smaller spaces so they're not exposed in a bigger room and they can feel safe. And of course, we always check what's happening with our animals when it comes to their body weight, when it comes to their schedule for shedding, feeding and everything else. Now, what else do we have to think of? Shedding, like I said, it's an incredibly important part of the life cycle of snakes. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why people are not biggest fan of. The reason is also probably because unlike other reptiles, they shed in one piece. Again, remember, they don't have legs, so they can't help themselves with that. So when they want to shed, because the skin is now too small, they've grown, um, they will start indicating that by having what we call foggy eyes, meaning that they will shed over the eye as well. Uh, and to protect the eye from the peeling pain, uh, there is some liquid that then pours out after the shed happens. So the snake will start literally hitting its head on a surface, uh, a rough surface, like a rock or a um, branch, until it can create a little pop at the front and then grab that part and then attach it to the uh, rough surface and slowly slid out like you would if you were pulling your arm out of your sweater. We are hoping that the snake can do this perfectly in one piece from start to finish, which also is a great reaction to us giving them the highest animal welfare that they deserve. Because if the humidity is correct, if the food is correct, if the substrate is correct, and they are a good, um, they're young and healthy animals, then they should work in one piece. So it's seeing a full shed of a snake is a fascinating thing. Uh, and it's something we absolutely welcome. Smaller snakes, uh, younger snakes shed very often uh, because they're still growing, but your average size snakes will shed once a month, once every two months, or even less for the bigger ones as well. But what happens, so what we're hoping to do is to get that lovely full shed, which also can be used as a bio artifact later for sessions as well, for anybody who would like to learn with snakes, but meeting a real big live thing right now would be too much. A shed is a great way to do it. In, in case you're wondering, how does that feel? It's like touching a little plastic bag for fruit and veg. 
um, in a shop. And of course, if snakes do not shed correctly, like this poor fella here that I found on the internet, then we need to reevaluate about the conditions that they're living in and what needs changing. Is it the water bowl? Is it the uh, lighting? Is it the humidity and everything else? And in case you're wondering how do we help them like this, you actually bait them. <laughs> you can use, you can actually bait the animal. Sometimes it takes in one go, sometimes a couple of days uh, to help them remove all the uh, dead skin off, but it's a great way to do it. So once we thought of every single aspect when it comes to training animal behavior and the animal welfare that I need to think of, this is the classic zoo classroom that I would go for uh, to teach children about it with one space in the front for me and a half a circle for students and teachers. An important lesson that I've learned in Slovenia is you should have animal in a different part of the building. You shouldn't have vivariums in the classroom because taking the animal out in a very excited room is not always the best way to do it. So uh, it could be upsetting for the animal and also for somebody who might fear them to suddenly see the snake appear. So because of that, I am a big advocate of having snakes in different classrooms, in different rooms, and then being able to bring them there. And here's an important step. I will tell you what's happening. I will tell you that every single child in the classroom, an adult, believe it or not, adults are usually way more afraid of snakes than children are because they haven't yet learned to fear them as much as the adults did through the, over their longer life. So I will tell, we will meet a live animal. This animal is a snake. It is not venomous. It is a very lovely animal. I'm going to tell them the name of the animal. It makes a tremendous difference that the children can and adults can actually connect with this animal through their name, Rudy, Greta, Monty, D, Zula. I had quite a few snakes in my career now. Um, and learn a little bit more about them as individuals, because this is the important part. They're not here to meet a giant group of animals called snakes, 4,000 species of them. No, they're here to learn about snakes with the help of this one particular individual that is gonna help them understand them. So if Rudy comes, he will come with me. I will then walk out of the classroom and bring Rudy in my hands and then come to my chair in the middle of the classroom. You can see it right there in front of the artifacts and sit there and just have Rudy in my lap and talk about him. Talk about why he's doing things. Why is he important? Because in those five minutes of introduction, he is scanning the room, smelling everything. And also children have the time to notice what behaviors he's doing, that he stops when he feels safe, that he rests when he feels safe. And I want all of that for them before I choose to go around the classroom and even allow children to touch him. We use fingertips so we can feel, maybe even feel where the uh, spine is. And then go one more circle if anybody would like to help support him, as in help hold part of him, just to feel those amazing strong muscles uh, in their hands, because again, we remember and experience so much if we can touch things. Uh, please know that every single of these steps happens with me telling them what's going to happen and asking every single individual. I do not care what your friends are doing. I do not care if your teacher is brave or not. I only care about every single individual and what they deem safest for them. If they just want to look, Brilliant. Let's just look. If they want to touch, and majority of them want to touch, then they can. And if I go one more circle around the classroom and ask them about uh, would anybody like to feel their weight or help support them, again, majority of children, 95% as far, would help hold it. The bigger problems are the teachers and the parents that accompany them because they usually come with already decided feelings about these animals, which are usually very negative. But if they do it for the sake of their child, for the sake of their student, or for the sake of finally trying to get over their fear of snakes, I welcome that. It is fascinating to see how some of them work through. I had a lady who worked through 45 years of trauma, uh, being afraid of snakes, that she stepped on one of them as a child, my mother including in the same story as well, um, that decided to finally try to understand them. 
and try to face that unknown that she only heard bad things about but never really had the proof for herself. So this is how it works. You can see on the left picture, you have my nephew again. He's meeting a more lively snakes. And in the, on the left is my one of my older brothers. And why I have him in the picture is, first, he has a child with him, a small baby that, of course, will not be touching the snakes, just like I wouldn't let that child touch any other pet. And also, my brother is terrified of snakes. Both of them are. Uh, my, I come from a family where only my dad loves snakes, uh, always has, always protects them. He works in construction. So whenever he unearths one and he's building houses or anything, he moves them to a new location. He's very, very caring and loving. And I learned a lot about respecting wildlife from him. But my mom is terrified of snakes and has been since her early childhood when she stepped on one in the grass and it went into a defensive pose, lifting its head up to scare her. And of course, she carried that fear with her for 60 years almost, uh, and also taught my brothers, not intentionally, but still, that this is the animal to fear. So I'm very happy that even though my brother is not the biggest fan of them, he's still there to help the next generation learn a little bit more about them and what we can do to protect them. And of course, for general visitors as well, believe it or not, on some days when it's incredibly sunny in Mediterranean, we are even allowed to take snakes outside, which is really, really good. So why do we do all of this? Let's go for the final one. Are our aims in the story that is snakes are misunderstood. Snakes are amazing animal ambassadors. What are our aims as a conservation educators around the world? I want to teach you about why they're important. I want to tell you about the fascinating role they play in the ecosystem, uh, in the food web, and how they are connected to every other animal. That by protecting them, you protect the bigger and the smaller animals that live in the same biome as well. So snakes are an incredibly important piece of the puzzle. I want you, when I talk to you, for example, in Slovenia, we have, I believe, 14 species of snakes, and only three of them, luckily, are venomous. How do you recognize which one's which? I do not want you to come close to them to check that they have narrow eyelids, uh, slits. Uh, I do not need that, and neither do you. But if you do see a snake like this one, uh, Vipera group, uh, you're going to notice they're literally telling you, I am venomous. How do you know? They have a great combination of pattern and color uh, on their back that stands out. So this snake is literally telling you, I have zigzag little stairs on my body to alert uh, birds in the sky and also humans and other potential predators that I am venomous and you should leave me alone. And of course, with other parts of the world, very often coloration is the way to go. So just amphibians that have strong colors to try to tell them, tell you, leave me alone, I'm dangerous. It's snakes as well. It doesn't work for all the species, of course not, uh, but it's also a great way for us to speak to people. Another important thing that we want to do is Please be a responsible pet owner if you are thinking about having snakes. They can live 25 years, 35 years, 50 years, depending on the species, and all the requirements that you have to think of when you are planning to have a snake. Uh, how will you feed it? How will you clean out the enclosure? What about UV and lighting and, and the humidity and warmth? All these welfare concerns need to be addressed if you want to be a responsible owner and not throw your snake, like I said in the story before, in a bin for us to find later and give it a second home. What to do if you meet a snake? Either you or you, you with your children, you with your dog as you're walking around. Um, what to do about animals like that? And remember, the main topic, the main lesson here always is snakes don't want to interact with you. Wild snakes don't want to interact with you. They are there because you caught them middle between doing something else, whether they were hiding in a narrow spot to feel safe or whether they're moving to a new location to find food or thermoregulate. That snake doesn't want to do anything with you. So if you can, if it's outside and you can just avoid it, give it a big wide berth and just go around it or go back and that snake will go its merry way and with the help of vibration even know when you're going. This is the, what, the important one, depending on part of the world you're from, snakes in your home, uh, how to make sure that snakes do not come to your house, or how to use your knowledge when you're building homes, when you are having your own farm animals, pets and similar, to understand what are the reasons that snakes do find their way in our homes and how to deal with that and how to 
if possible, prevent it. And then, of course, do not do that. Please, I know some people are big fans of snakes to the point that they believe that they're your number one pet that you can lie on and have your very, very small children. This child isn't even too young uh, to be with them. They always need professional care and supervision when it comes to things like that, because in the end, it would be animals fault that it's done something um, despite not actually being treated that way when they and they had access to the child or pets or anything like that. Uh, is it comfortable for the animal that somebody's riding them and things like that? Probably not, even with the size of an animal like that. And also, again, uh, such animals should be evaluated continuously with their behavior, just like you would with a reactive dog uh, to know what's happening. And maybe a story from my friend, uh, her name is Sam. She is petrified of snakes, absolutely, is her entire life. And she knows she has a teenage daughter that wants to study animal husbandry uh, and conservation. So she asked us to help her work with snakes, to help her understand, even just by looking at them, why are they the way they are? So believe it or not, see, some stories do take way longer than 15 minutes uh, for somebody to go through that massive fear of snakes and what we can do. Uh, to understand them better, a lot of crying, but if there is a will for a person to, they have to choose for themselves that they want to do it, we can do everything else, provide safe space, provide support, explain everything, do it step by step and go back if we need to, but in the end, you help that person become very confident being around snakes. She doesn't need to have one as pet, she doesn't need to go and search for them in the wild, please don't do that in general, but it allows her to maybe have an exciting field trip in a zoo without fearing that she's going to run into snake and then burst and crying, creating that, passing that fear and hysteria to the next generation that this is something horribly bad. So this and many other stories are why I'm doing it, because I really believe that we are a part of a healthy, healthy ecosystem. We're part of nature. And whenever people like to say the story, oh, deer was on the road. No, the road is going through deer's habitat. It's kind of the lesson here as well. Snakes, all 4,000 species of them around the world uh, have an important role to play in it. And I welcome any discussion, any advancements in us wanting to give them the best welfare we can and treat them as an important part of a healthy ecosystem. So everybody, thank you so much for listening. I hope that wasn't too long. So I'm going to stop sharing so we can chat. <laughs> thank you for that. Um... Interesting presentation on snakes. Uh, I have lots of questions in the chat box for okay. you because I know everybody's excited about this uh, presentation. So I also would like to tell the participants that, of course, we are going to exceed our time. We are going to exceed Apologies. our time because even <laughs> the questions yet, I'm not sure we'll be able to exhaust it in 30 minutes. But believe me, you will find them interesting, you know, to learn more about Thanks. Yeah. So let me just go quickly into the questions. Thank you so much, Azim. We appreciate the presentation. So the first one here is, uh, do, how do snakes communicate? Do they vocalize? And if they do, what kind of vocalization do they have? Uh, believe it or not, the snakes are not known for vocalization. If there is, it's usually relating to them defensively, like hissing. Other than that, it is mostly by smell. So they find each other and track each other with the help of smell. Uh, vocalization is not a common thing for them. Okay. Then one quick one for me is how can one easily identify a poisonous snake? I just come in contact uh, with one, you know? How do I know? Okay, yeah. this one is a poisonous one. This is not. First thing we have to remember when it comes to uh, snakes and uh, vocabulary is that they are venomous. Poisonous is going to mean that there's something eaten. There are some species of poisonous snake, which means if something eats them, it's going to be negatively affected. But all of them, the ones that are venomous, means that they can inject their venom into their prey. The problem is there is no 100% bulletproof technique. Because we live in such different parts of the world with such different habitats that snakes have adapted to it. The easiest ones are the ones that have warning colors telling you, leave me alone, strong red, strong yellow, 
combination of different patterns is the snake telling you in the jungle, mm -hmm. I am venomous, leave me alone. In Europe, it is with that little zigzag uh, coloration and they're usually much shorter and stockier animals compared to some other snakes. But then if you and I go to Australia right now, the most venomous snake is gonna be brown. It is it's going to be incredibly difficult. It's going to be generic brown, very difficult to tell. Uh, so sadly, there is no uh, direct way to do it. I would suggest for everybody uh, attending from different parts of the world today, research your own country species online. I, I dabbled a little bit in Nigerian group. I believe you have quite a lot, I think 18 species of venomous snakes. I will have to re-research re that one, but I was reading quickly through it, and some of them do not have any real distinct coloration patterns to help you know it's them. But we can have that as a separate tutoring session for the future. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. So who is more dangerous? Do you think snakes are more dangerous or human beings are more dangerous? That's just... Absolutely human beings. Remember... <laughs> We, we are quite irrational creatures. Snakes are, in majority of the cases, very predictable animals. They don't want wild snakes to do anything with us. They want to be left alone uh, because, like I said, they can feel the vibration of us coming. It already physically affects them and hits them, uh, so they want to move away from it. We are dangerous. We are giant. Snake is a long animal, but one step of our boot on a snake's head could probably injure it to the point of dying. So snakes are not <laughs> the, the problem that I see when it comes working with the animals. It's, it's the painful <laughs> okay, thank you. Is there any effective first aid treatment you can recommend for a snake bite, even though you don't know the particular snake, snake species that uh, bit you? So whenever possible, please, yeah, if you can see the snake that bit you, that is incredibly valuable information because it can help uh, the med medical staff to know what to give you. Um, what to do, please do not suck out the poison. Venom, apologies. Do not do that because your inside of your mouth is incredibly delicate part of your body. It will be absorbed or even drunk into another part of it, and then you will get sicker very quickly. What to do is it does depend. The, the further away from your heart, the better. The further away from the heart, if it's tip of your extremities, like your leg or your or your arm, that is the best, best uh way to if you get bitten to uh, seek help and if possible you do have to use a constraint around that extremity if it's your leg or your hand to slow down this the progression of the venom into the rest of your body uh, and then of course yes please please seek medical attention the problem is of course that certain species have incredible venom uh, that affects nervous system, blood clogging, and similar very quickly. So even if you're walking somewhere and you just feel something has bitten you, but you don't see anything, do stop and examine if that is a wound. Have you by accident been bitten by a snake that you maybe stepped on? You didn't even realize because they are not vocal, they, you didn't hear anything, and you just felt a pinch on your, uh, on your hand, leg that that might be a snake bite and you need seek medical attention. But yes, please do not suck out the, the venom. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. So there is a question here. I think you've answered it, but let me see if it is the same. What are the common snake colors? Uh, so again, you depending on what you have, you have two extremes. Extreme of camouflage and extreme of very visible warning colors. So anything from your beautiful brown beige pattern like the royal pythons to very strong coral snake milk snake so again depending on part of the world i originate from eastern europe all our snakes are brown <laughs> a little bit of brown a little bit of gray a little bit of black but as you all go into the jungles of the world they're gonna uh, they're gonna step up the game by having very very warning colors or incredible camouflage Okay, thank you so much. So if I got what you said earlier, is that there is no distinguishing characteristics that we can use to differentiate a venomous and non-venomous snake, right? It depends on I mean, geographical location and things like that. Exactly, because I could give you the worst ex example, which is open its mouth and check if it has fangs. Please do not do that. <laughs> if a snake is your generic 
tighten, boa constrictor, uh, and similar, which uh, hunts by uh, squeezing its prey. Uh, it has this many teeth, but they're all roughly the same size and shape backwards. If you have a venomous snake, it always have two fangs that they use to expel the poison, uh, either by biting or spraying it. But of course, I, in no conscious can I, can I as an educator or a biologist ask you to open its mouth and check that. So please, for everybody attending today, research your own country's species uh, to know what to expect. Thank you so much. <laughs> that is interesting. So are uh, all snake species solitary? Uh, majority of the time, yes. You do have certain snake species, they like to hibernate together. Uh, when If you just go in and type in, in Google uh, snake den, you're going to see thousands of snakes of the same species living in caves. And not only do they do that for warm, they're also looking for their mating partner as well. Uh, so majority of the time, yes you do have snakes as solitary animals. Even in uh, education, uh, we mostly have snakes uh, in their own vivariums as well. There's a couple of exceptions with royal pythons uh, that they've been with a certain individual for 20 years. So they, they seem very nice and comfortable with each other. But other than that, I would have them separately, especially when you think that certain species like some of the milk snakes eat their own species. So snakes also eat snakes. Not all of them, but it can be done. <laughs> I know fish eat fish. This one is snake. There you go. No, now you know as well. Snakes can also eat snakes, even including younger ones or anything, including their own species. But what could what could be the reason for that? That's the form of cannibalism, right? Is it because Indeed it you is. can't find a, a, a prey or something? Uh, it, it is a, a form of cannibalism, but again, for certain species coming in, living in a harsh environment or doesn't have enough nutrients at that point, eating a smaller snake as a source of food is a way to go. Again, like I said, most mm -hmm. species don't do that. If I work with raw pythons, they will eat mice, they will eat uh, rats, they will eat birds, uh, but not. I haven't heard much about them eating their own species, but with some other ones like milk snakes, they can eat younger, smaller uh, members of their own species. <laughs> that is Remember, with, with snakes, <laughs> when, when it comes to biology and the reproduction strategy, uh, capitalized R or lower R, whether the animals have loads of uh, babies and don't take care of them, or they have a few babies and take care of them. Snakes are depending on the species as well. Some of them only have a few and actually spend some time with their young before they start venturing into the world as they're big and stronger. And some of them only lay their eggs uh, and once the incubation is done, they just leave. Uh, so they just try to produce as many offspring as possible. Yeah, let, let, let me take you on that. Uh, <laughs> I, I, from the little I know, they lay eggs, right? Depending, believe it or not, they have three joys. Joy number one, they lay eggs. Joy okay. number two, they give birth to live young. Or joy number three, they lay eggs inside their body, hatch inside their body, and then give birth to the live young. Where does the live one come out from the body? Yeah. So cloaca. again, it's the cloaca. Remember that small exit uh, at the very end of the body. Uh, with pythons, it's about just five centimeters before the end. With thinner snakes, it's longer. That's the one place that everything comes out of. Uh, if a snake needs to go to the toilet, it comes out of there. If a snake needs to lay an egg, it comes from there. If a snake needs to give birth to a baby, it comes from there. The only thing that would come on the other side, back through the mouth, if, if it's a snake ate something that can't be digested, they're amazing at eating eggs and they will spit out the shell. Okay. okay. Yeah, so they use their muscles in their neck to crush it, swallow what is good, and expel what they don't want. But they do have incredibly strong stomach accent. Okay. So for those that lay eggs, they dig the, the soil and bury it, right? Um, depending on the species, some of them are amazing mothers. Some of them lay, the, uh, lay down the eggs and then uh, go around them in a spiral and keep them safe. Oh, keep them goodness. safe from predators. They are, you know, remember, we would like to think of them as literally cold-blooded creatures that mm -hmm. are just mean and evil. But some of them are brilliant mothers and protect their babies 
uh, to the expense of their own survival and needs. So they don't leave them. Uh, they wait there, uh, keep them warm, keep them safe, and regulate the body, the temperature of the nest. Uh, and I, they do not have the behavior in form of coming with the food to feed the babies, because as with the moment they're hatched, they're already self-sufficient individuals. They ta can take care of themselves, like the chickens. Uh, so once they learn out what they're doing, they can take care of themselves in form of eating food. But with snakes, please, please, please never think of them as this cold-blooded animal that is just mean all the time. Cloaca is the exit for all of it. Uh, and it's a fascinating way for us to learn about them. It's also the way that we can determine uh, sex of the animal. It doesn't always work 100%. Uh, very often, you also need to look at some other characteristics, but it is a great um, part of a snake for biology research. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So how, how many days does it take the egg to hatch? Uh, it's going to be about, oh, depends on the, on the species of the animal, anything from one month and up. And an interesting thing, thing about snakes, they also lay what we call slugs. So in your particular research field, that's going to be your unfertilized eggs. Uh, but these are very obviously slugs, meaning that they are wetter looking, darker looking, smaller, irre irregularly shaped. Uh, they lay them, but nothing, of course, will, will hatch out of them. They're not fertilized. And like I said, we call them slug eggs. Uh, uh, but in general, please also know, um, because snakes are reptiles, their shell is soft, which means it's more affected by the weather compared to birds. So let me go on with the questions in the chat. Box. <laughs> I hope you go early today. So what are the challenges you face as an hepatologist? Well, the one thing is um, snakes have a very bad rap. People don't like snakes. People believe they already know everything about them. So they think they don't need convincing that maybe they're not embodied evil uh, in the world. And the other one is, remember, since I've worked in modern zoos around in Iaza and Biaza um, around the continent now, you're going to notice that people will usually come to the zoo for tigers, elephants, your big and fluffy and cute animals, which means zoos have this incredibly difficult choice when they have to create a healthy balance of popular charismatic animals on one side that will bring the people in, like your meerkats, and the forgotten, might, maybe not the most aesthetically pleasing or understood taxa, um, like amphibians, snakes, even though it's these that need the most protection. When it comes to the ratio of how certain taxa are affected by the uh, wildlife trafficking, by the climate change, by the habitat destruction, yes, tigers, elephant, and everyone else. But then we forget that majority of the, let's say, amphibian species are at high risk of going extinct in the next five, 10 years because they are not represented in collections as much. They don't give them as much room. They don't give them as much attention. They don't give them as much funding as they do for the big fluffy ambassadors. But what I always do is I teach about animals and ecosystem as a whole. I adore you love tigers. That's amazing. That's my second favorite animal in the world. Uh, but um, if I teach about tiger and protecting the tiger habitat, I can also then teach you about the forgotten little snake or a mouse or a bird species or a snail that lives in the same habitat. And if we protect the tiger as an umbrella species, we also protect them as well. So yes, it absolutely comes with challenges, but I'm a very persistent and energetic educator. I'll, I'll find a way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is a whole day lecture on snakes. <laughs> of course, we can do one more. <laughs> The snake I'm presenting part. one in, in Portugal soon about modern zoos role. Attend that one. <laughs> <laughs> if you have time, you can attend that one as well. That's going to be more about the bigger picture of role, role of conservation in modern zoos. Okay, thank you. So there is a question here. Does snake skin color and pattern affect their adaptation and behavior? Yes, meaning you might have a snake that is trying to use mimicry to tell you I am venomous, but I'm not, leave me alone. You might have a coloration that is very camouflage, 
Royal Pythons, again, are just the perfect example. If you remember Rudy and all the snakes from my presentation, they're brown and black and olive color. There's a reason for it. They're a perfect combination of light and shadow. So if this snake lives in Egypt under a tree on a sunny day, that's the color it has. The sun shining through the, through the tree tops onto the ground creates the combination of light, the olive, and dark, the black color of that snake. Uh, so yes, the patterns, are, and of course, each individual has its own unique pattern, uh, and certain um, herpetology, I'm going to say more hobbyists, people who are really intrigued by snakes and are breeding them, um, they also are trying to create all these very unique, unnatural colorations, especially with pythons. You have everything from yellow to pink to red and white. Again, it's just finding that recessive gene and seeing how these uh, genes express themselves if you cross two different species, two different individuals uh, from the same species. But again, that's not the coloration that I talk about. That I'm talking about the snakes in their wild form. And the other one is more of a hobbyism. But there is variation in color and reason behind it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think it, I know that it has to do with adaptation at times, uh, yep. camouflage, you know, to be able to hide uh, from um, uh, predators. That's why I say, that's why majority of them will just be brown yeah. if they live on the floor, or will yeah. be green if they live in the tree top. Yeah. And that's where it stops. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> there is this. Uh, you have worked with snakes, you have lived with them. Of course, they have uh, a lot of behavior. Which one is more interesting to you of their several my, type of behavior? I, I have two of my favorite behaviors about snakes. Behavior number one is the one that I mentioned, the safety bracelet. If you're working with a snake that it's your medium size, the smallest size, you notice that they are the vulnerable creature in the situation. You are big and strong, you are tall. So they hold on to you just in case. I, so even if I then untangle it, and I have to do it very uh, nice and safe and the gentle, and I move them around, they will find it again on the other hand. So they will always try to have that sense of, of safety. The other one that I adore about snakes is they seek safety. So if I work in a classroom that doesn't have a carpet and it has like a lovely smooth floor, if I put the snake on the floor, it's not gonna stay there. It's not going to slither towards the children. It's not. It's usually going to go towards me and go between my legs on the other side of my chair, or it's going to go under a table or something. Just again to prove a point that they're not here to seek us in form of "I want to bite you," "I want to check what's happening." No, they just if they have a choice, they will move away and hide in a small space so they feel nice and safe. Wow. <laughs> Thank you not here to harm us. So we just walk away, right? Just walk away. Yeah. <laughs> so hey, there is a question here. Do you have any experience working with or can you share anything you know about skinks since they are closely related to snakes too? Uh, is, is, skinks? Are we talking about the lizards that don't have legs? I don't know what skinks is. S -K -I, I believe so. N -K <laughs> I don't know to, what it to, is. My, to my to my to my uh, person asking the question, uh, please understand that I I speak about oof, nine languages, so I sometimes learn different animal groups in different languages. I oh. believe I know which animal you're talking about. There is a group of lizards that don't have legs. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not venomous. They live in, in Europe as well. Uh, how do you know if it's a snake or a snake? Snakes can't wink at you. That's kind of the best way to do it. Snakes have eyes permanently closed. They can't wink. And also snakes do not have to, unlike the lizards, snakes do not have to open their mouth to get the tongue out. And there is no big difference between the back of the head and the neck. If you're talking about snakes, there is an obvious difference between the head and the neck. And with the lizards, it's quite chunky and it just continues from it. Again, an interesting one uh, is that those lizards can lose their tail and it can represent up to 40% of their body length. So it's quite obvious when such an animal loses its tail. And believe it or not, even though snake's cloaca is so far towards the end and the rest of it is body and head, with these reptiles, the cloaca is kind of almost two thirds or even halfway through their body. 
and that's where everything comes out. So if something attacks them and the tail falls off, they're going to lose about 40% of their body length. It will grow back, but not in a perfect length as it did before. There we go. <laughs> if I have mistaken, please find me on, on in LinkedIn and I'll answer it correctly. But again, I'm trying to remember all my animals from my either from Latin or English or Slovenian or, or German. <laughs> <laughs> it's in different languages, right? Yeah. So here is uh, we can relate the behavior of several livestock species with that of humans. What lesson can we learn from snake? What lessons can we humans learn from snake? Just give us one, please. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What is a lesson? Don't judge. Don't judge in advance. I think, you know, we are very, very judgy. Judgy towards other people. Judgy towards other culture. Judgy towards yeah. other uh, groups. And we, we, we shouldn't. When, when I last a year ago, I designed a new pro, a new event at my zoo called Spirit Animals. So I really wanted to write it in form of, you know, go around the zoo and it's written in a way that it gives you three human like characteristics. I like sunny weather. I like taking long trips with my friends. But then it links it to the ecology of different animals, the vultures, the sloth, the maned wolf, the cheetah. And of course, everybody would joke, ha, 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 since I have a sloth, I am the lazy one. But then you realize there's so many other impactful things about that species. And intentionally, I made one of the 10 species a snake because I wanted people when they stood next to that station and realized, okay, here we go. It's gonna be snake, it's gonna be negative, it's gonna be backstabbing, it's gonna be, no, snakes are incredibly, they're mysterious animals. So are certain people. Certain people don't seek attention, don't seek to be in the forefront of everything. And they're absolutely happy that way. Snakes are too. Uh, I had one when it says, uh, snakes will cancel plans if it's bad weather, just like some people will. You know, they won't do it in form of, ah, oh, I'm not going to go there. But because their body temperature it depends on the external factors, if they're too cold, they can't move. So they will just rather rest for a while until the circumstances are good again so they can go and, dare I say, seize the day. So all these things, I was so happy that in the beginning, nobody would want to have a snake as their spirit animal or a cockroach as their spirit animal. But I noticed whenever I had these presentations with people and I was there to talk about them, so many of them in the end took their little sticker with a little snake and placed them on their little heart and went around the zoo all proud knowing that that is their animal. Even though half an hour ago, they might think it's completely different to us and in no way can we see the similarities. Yeah, so uh, we're really expecting your book to be out. <laughs> and so we can <laughs> learn more lessons. Uh, we humans can learn more lessons from uh, the snake and other animals that you're Absolutely. writing about. Yeah, yeah the, yeah, the questions are still here. And yeah, what is the reproductive cycle like for snakes? The pet snakes are very interesting animals. Like I said, they're solitary for majority of the time. They find each other with a sense of smell. And then depending again on the different species, sometimes they have those mating rituals when they basically like uh, dance next to each other uh, and intertwine their uh, necks and going up uh, before they connect with the cloacas. So again, it's that exit uh, um, at the, towards the end of the body. And that's when the male who has, believe it or not, two penises, um, just in case if something goes wrong and one of them breaks off, he still has another one. There you go, an interesting one today. Uh, yeah, just in case, because otherwise that male would be taken out of the genetic pool. Uh, because again, remember, in certain species, female is abnormally larger than male, four or five times bigger than male to be able to carry 50, 60 eggs, size of a great area or emu, quite a giant egg. Um, so, and then after that, it's going to be just the station period with, it depends again on the species, something longer, something shorter, but the female does eat more and, uh, closer towards the, uh, laying of the eggs becomes less and less and less active. Uh, and basically in any of those cases, if I ever work with a reproductive pair or a female, that animal would never be on the list of handling for anything. Just like I wouldn't do it with any other species, that animal is now in a more 
demanding vulnerable part of its cycle uh, and we shouldn't be adding stress to it because some of their behavior can also change uh, they become more defensive uh, because they feel like you know they're trying to create this safe den and you are intruding there so aside from um, welfare concerns when it comes to husbandry changing water feeding and everything we just uh, offer this animal a similar um situation that we would before but probably with more food and everything like that depending with the eggs some are amazing at taking care of them i have worked with snakes that basically boiled their own eggs they were scalding on so tight that they basically cooked whatever was inside and nothing nothing uh was able to hatch because the temperature was not correct and in certain individuals again it's not species related it's individuals related just like with humans there i say some are a little bit better with kids than other uh it comes with practice uh they um some of these eggs would then be incubated in special little chambers for, with the correct humidity and heat and it allows us to turn them around as well uh so we can then uh hatch them with the help of incubators Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing is straightforward, is it? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, we still need to, to catch up with the questions. Oh, yes, please. Does removal of the snake venom have any psychological effect on them? No. Of course, again, um, removing of the venom, you probably saw it all. It's kind of have a, a little vial and on it, it's a little membrane and the snake's uh, fangs are pressed on it to release the venom into the little vial, but not on us. Uh, again, I would go with the psychological effect. No, if you are not causing stress. How do I say that? If you, just like with every other animal, are teaching the animal that this is a neutral or a positive experience, uh, the animal shouldn't be affected by it because the venom is not, they need it in the wild to hunt their prey. They bite, they release venom, and then very importantly, they let go. Venomous snakes do not hold on to their um, prey in great majority of the experiences because they could get hurt. They could get damaged by the prey kicking and biting and doing whatever else it is doing. So they bite, release the venom, and go back. After the prey runs away, they use their sense of smell and heat receptors and vibration to follow it until it falls down and dies. And that's when they grab it and they start uh, swallowing it. So when it comes to the venom, it is that's why they need it. They don't need it as a normal functioning snake in a zoo. Uh, so if somebody, because I know a lot of research is being done on use of venom to create medication, especially as an anti-venom, for that particular species. That's what your zoos and your hospitals have. That's why it's so important to know what bit you, if you do know, because it allows them to narrow it down to that particular um, anti-venom serum uh, that they have produced uh, for them. But yes, if the, my only problem is you do need to have someone who knows what they're doing. Grabbing a snake by the neck, it is it, by the neck, it is quite a skill. Uh, some of them are but used to it, some of them are not and will fight back because uh, they remember, even though they can't bite you, they do have a long body that they're trying to slither out. Uh, so if you know what you're doing and your grip is firm and correct, it can be done very quickly and the animal then release back. But again, aside from seeing it from point of view of scientific research for creating medication to help people, I don't see a reason to do it. Believe it or not, majority of the zoos uh, don't hold venomous species for that reason, because by law, you have to also then hold anti-venom anti serum on site for your staff just in case, which is, of course, a big health and safety uh, um, um, problem. Uh, so majority of them don't. Again, I understand the zoos that do, the organizations that do, because believe it or not, even those venomous ones absolutely need protection if they're endangered species. Uh, but those are very specialized experts working with them. And also, please know that animal would never be part of a teaching session ever. <laughs> Thank you, Azim. Thank you so much. This is really in no insightful. And uh, here, uh, a, a venomous snake 
can it be made to become non-venomous using gene editing and knockout? Oh my goodness, I like that one. That's very biotechnology, which is what I studied. Yes, I am sure that with proper genetic manipulation, you could phase out the venom part of it. Of course, this would be the animal that would live in captivity because remember, like I said, the, the nature, the hunting nature of that individual species for millions of years is bite, release, release venom, and then release the prey, go back. Uh, which means that animal wouldn't be able, at least not right away, to adapt to actually not having venom. So even when they're hatched, venomous species, babies are already equipped with venom so they can get their food within the first few weeks. Uh, so yes, I am sure to a certain degree it can be done if we can, what is the last, what is the one about cow milk being able to produce substance that creates um, twine similar to the spider web uh, I'm sure, yeah, if that exists, I am sure this can be done as well, but I don't see any reason for it because the only one I could picture it is I like that species, but it's venomous, so I don't want to be near it unless it's not venomous. But that's again more of an ego problem than us understanding species as in part of an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, thank you. A good question. Um, like thank you. Yeah, <laughs> it's quite interesting. Um, what is the uh, life expectancy of snakes? Depends on the species, but this is the one that I've noticed. They live longer in captivity if you take your care of them. Um, your classic corn snake is going to be living 25, 20 years, 25 in zoos. Your royal pythons can live 30 years, 40 in zoos. So I have known snakes who have lived almost half, uh, half a century as well. So they, they can live well long. What I say about them, another lesson about humans and us, take it slow. Snakes take everything slow. They eat roughly once a week if they're smaller to mid-sized snake. They eat a couple of times a year if they're a large snake and they eat a, believe it or not, a deer or a smaller cow. It's that size of an animal. Uh, and then they just rest and rest and rest and rest into uh, somewhere uh, hidden and a lot of sleep. Um, so depends on the species again, but yeah, it is a long-term com commitment if you are planning on having one as a pet or one in your zoo collection, at least 30 years. Wow. 30 years, right? Yeah, and, and remember, they don't look like it because they share, they continuously come out as this shiny new looking yeah. Yeah. animal. Yeah. <laughs> slightly bigger so we don't give them like on, on on mammals you can notice the aging with the hair coloration mm -hmm. especially around the face and the movement but snakes hide it really well <laughs> but do you think there is something in the skin that uh, maybe like a chemical or something that can be used for anti-aging stuff <laughs> It really isn't, because then you will have to do the same if I just started extracting it from our nails right now. The whole point of it is it's just the shine. It's that beautiful, healthy yeah. shine that we do have. If we take care of our hair, if we take care of our fingernails, they should remain in a lovely condition, no matter if they turn as mine, slightly grayer now. <laughs> uh, so no, I would say no, because then again, I could link it to rhino poaching as well. Remember, rhinos are hunted for their horn. Their horn is literally my hair stuck together in a gel. It's nothing chemically different from it than hair, uh, and it's similar for them. So I would think it's just their amazing ability to do it. And also, my lovely person do, asking the question, don't forget that even though you know, we are aging and I'm showing and also are we, um, you are continuously regenerating every single day. Your cells are creating new cells. Your skin, even though you don't peel in giant pieces like a turtle or in one piece like a snake, you are continuously replacing your every single cell in your body with new ones. And dare I say, luckily for species like ours, we'll still live sometimes. 70, 80, 100 years. So I would dare to say that's quite a lot, isn't it? <laughs> You're a funny person. I try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So here, Dr. Okay says, um, I appreciate your passion, your passionate presentation. Indeed, it is uh, 
from fear to fascination. In any event, you suddenly come in contact with a snake that is ready to attack you. Can you talk about measures to take to, to keep safe? Uh -huh. So here we go. One of the one of the most important things about snake that looks aggressive is to recognize the signs of aggression. First one is that the animal is contracting back. Snakes usually will not bite you if they're lying directly on you on the surface and just suddenly choose to bite you. It can happen, but it's not often. What snakes are trying to do is give you a body language warning to keep away. So what do they do? They contract about one third of their body back, very, usually very noticeable in, let's say, uh, rattlesnakes. It goes back. It allows them to create this little spring effect when they can then pounce, grab, bite, or usually since this is defensive, they won't hold on to, they'll probably just let go. But that stretch back allows them to quickly project themselves forward, bite, and then go back into safety. So how would I, when would I think that the snake is trying to bite me if I saw that behavior? If it's trying to contract back and then going for it. How would I deal with it? I would not pick up that snake. I would not work with that snake because there might be a reason why it's doing it. It might be doing something that I don't know. Is it trying to lay eggs? Is it trying to go to the toilet? Remember, for animals, that is a vulnerable time because something could be, could attack them during that. Maybe it's not, in any way happy with its conditions. Maybe it's too hot. So it's been under stress for days or weeks. It can't tell you. Remember, it's not sweating. It's not vocal. So you need to try to see what it is. If I had to pick up a dangerous snake and I'm not comfortable in that situation, but needs to be moved, I would use a specialized hook, which is kind of like a metallic meter long hook that allows you to pick up the first part of the body and then remove, uh, pick up the animal and move it to, let's say, a new enclosure uh, with the head away from me. Just to give you an idea, I remember that picture of the child that was lying on the python towards the end. In a zoo collection, by law, with our requirements, that, uh, that python would need to be picked up by about five to six people, mm -hmm. just in case. One around the neck, one at the end, and three, four in the middle, to support its body so it doesn't strain, it doesn't hurt its muscles and rib cage or its organs, and also so it doesn't have an opportunity to throw you on the floor and start wrapping around you. What mm -hmm. misconception is that snakes will wrap around your neck. They won't. They can hold on to it because it's a nice and easy way to grab onto something because, again, they don't have legs. Uh, but again, the target would be the chest. Your chest expanding with your inhaling and exhaling is what the snake would try to stop. I'm now being very negative about us being the target of it. Again, remember, snakes don't seek us. Snakes will go for your mice, your birds, your capybara, your deer. But just to give you an idea that that animal, when trying to protect itself, would need to be, uh, would go for the chest part of your body. And that's why I'm saying, when I see pictures like that, I was like, Oof, what would you do if that snake suddenly did turn on a child? Mm. Remember, I said it takes about six people to, mm. to, to pick up what is 50 kilos worth of muscle and a lot of strength in it. And also teeth. I'm not so worried about them. Yes, you would need to disinfect. Yes, the bigger snakes, they can be very long, but it's holding on tight. Uh, and um, then the animal can start wrapping around it. So Absolutely, when working with snakes, professional experience is incredibly important, especially when we're talking about big animals, um, because you, you don't want to be in a situation when something does go wrong. So aggressive animals, leave alone, try to figure out why they're being aggressive. If you do need to move them, move them with the help of other people in a safe manner, and then address the problem in form of oh, it will be better in a week. No, do, do your research, find out why it is uh, that it's doing this. It might just be that it's not used to handling. It might be that it's somebody before you fed it directly in the, in the terrarium. So it means if I open terrarium, that means food is coming. You know, and, and, and again, uh, very often I'm trying to teach people about animals, in big carnivores as well, is it's not animals' fault. They're reacting how they are, have been conditioned 
to do, so we need to know what we're doing and be con uh, consistent with our welfare. So if somebody does it one way, we make sure that this is the correct way and that we all follow, even if that person is not in. So we're not creating negative behaviors and stressing the animals, which goes for every animal in, in, in zoos or on farm anyway. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> As if, uh, uh, how can we know, or uh, let me say in few words, what can you say about having snakes as pets? I I would be okay with having snakes as a pet. I don't have one because I do work a lot and, and, and uh, I'm everywhere when it comes to traveling around the country. Um, choose a good species that is suitable for beginners. I would have, I would say Royal Python for sure, 1.2 meters in length. They do live for 35 years, so please know that. They eat about once a week and you do need to provide them with that food. Depending on the country you're in, you're either going to feed them live mice or mice that we call them microwave mice. Basically, you buy them from a pet store uh, and you feed that to the animal so the prey is not alive. And of course, clean up after them. They have incredibly strong stomach acid to be able to digest their food for smaller ones in about three, four days which is brilliant because they melt pretty much everything, including bone um, of their smaller prey. Um, and then uh, handle your animal. The animal there is, so have it in a terrarium, but have a positive interactions with you. They do not bond with us in form of a cuddlier mammal, but they do get comfortable around people that are calm because it shows in your body language, it shows in your body chemistry that you're not producing stress hormones, you're not, because believe it or not, if you're a snake and part of your body is just the flat surface of your belly resting on somebody's hand, they feel the vibration of your uh, heartbeat under the skin. If the heartbeat is elevated, it means you're panicking. If you're panicking, it means you're the person who has a greater chance of hurting them. Say so they don't want to be around you. Mm -hmm. So whenever somebody says, you know, I always go, snakes are amazing lie detectors. They 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 pick up a lot about what's happening around them and analyze it. So we feel um, so we feel like, oh my goodness, they they're just overreacting. But are there any subtle ways that your body is telling them that maybe they should be nervous, that maybe you are not sure. And I always notice that when I teach, when I train new stuff um, in a zoo, rangers, when it's like, oh, sure, sure, give me that thing. I was like, Ooh, that's a lot of movement, which means you are very confident on the outside, but probably maybe not even afraid, excited on the inside and the snake is picking that up. So yes, I would say if you can provide for these gorgeous animals for 40, 30, 40 years, uh, please do. They are lovely. They are beautiful. There's so much to learn about them. And once you have them as a pet, uh, you kind of start appreciating all the little things that they do and maybe recognize yourself in them a lot as well. <laughs> well. This is a whole lot of interest and uh, good facts to know about there stuff. you go we love good facts yeah they are wonderful facts. how many more questions do we have do uh, we have this here we go <laughs> we still have like <laughs> maybe seven so maybe seven. oh my goodness we'll be here forever apologies everyone today is a fun interesting day about snakes <laughs> so i will just um there are some maybe you just answer briefly and oh so, that's good yeah how can we estimate the age of snakes? Is it possible to estimate? Uh, if you know the species and the sex, you can look at the size of the animal. So that allows us to estimate it. So, But you do need to know the species and again, the, um, the species. So you can assess how long it should be if it's a full adult and how long it takes them to reach their size. And also sex of the animal, because remember in certain uh, species, there's a giant sexual dimorphism. Uh, so a female or a male could be progressing in size much quicker compared mm -hmm. to the other one. Uh, so you might think, oh, I have a 10 year old snake. It's actually five, but it's a female, uh, which is something we see in other species like turtles as well. Oh, okay. So I know that some people have heard it that when those that eat snake, that one needs to be careful with the bone or something that in case if the bone, you know, 
mm-hmm. hooks you or something that maybe it doesn't heal. I don't know, but that is something I've heard. I don't know if that is true. Uh, and then if, if, if somebody is eating snakes, to be careful with the yeah. bones of the yeah. snake. No, I haven't heard anything of that one. They do have a lot of bones. They do have 200, 300 vert, uh, uh, ribs alone, uh, but there's nothing chemically on them that should be feared uh, by anyone. So, Just a bone. You don't want it there anyway, because if it's <laughs> cooked, it's going to crack and it's going to injure yourself, your throat. So you don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> so what prompts the shedding of the shedding process? Is it aging or what? What is the main so thing? So it's the size. So they continuously grow throughout their life, exponentially grow in the beginning, continuously every week, two weeks. And then later it can happen only, let's say, once a year. Um, but it's the size. They basically become too big. And it starts cracking and um, the top layer of the skin is the only one that this slowly disattaches. That's why the change in color, the foggy eyes, and then they climb out of it slightly bigger than they were before. So it's that one. Yeah. So I will take the last question here and then we <laughs> open up the comments. If there is any other person that wants to maybe share his, his or our own experience. But here I want to thank, uh, this is Katarina. Uh, Katarina, first, I want to appreciate you for joining our meeting for the first time. And your comment here says that you found this meeting quite interesting. And I hope that you, you know, you continue to join our webinar. So the question for Katerina is that what is the smallest or the shortest snake species in the world? Oh, no, I will not know. No, I will not know its English name. It's about 10 centimeters long. And even then, if I say which one it is, I will probably be wrong again because they keep discovering new species. I think one of them, the, I think five to 10 were discovered in 2022 alone. They are very, very small animals. I believe one of them is named after Leonardo DiCaprio's mother. We'll check. Uh, <laughs> so it's a continuous knowledge regarding snakes. But yes, the smallest one in the world seems to be about 10 centimeters in, in uh, size, all the way to about eight and a half. I have heard of 11 and a half, but I need some, some actual proof. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. So I would like to hand over to the host and I appreciate all the participants for, you know, we actually- Thank you everyone. Time, but I appreciate you for staying because it's an opportunity for us to learn, you know, about this species. It's not everybody that, you know, knows about it or, or know, um, or likes them. Personally, I don't like them. The first thing that comes to my mind when I see them is to kill them. So, but that yeah. is why I thought it would be good to- But that's why we're doing it today, them. exactly. Understand. Yeah. yeah, thank you. So I hand over now to the host, Dr. Duro. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yasiri. And thank you so much, uh, Azim Kejelik. That was, that was a nice presentation. And if thank we you. give you time, you can talk for the whole day. <laughs> We can, we can. I'm very, I'm very <laughs> sure of that. I just want to, uh, if we have one or two people that want to say something in uh, one minute, if Thank you want to say something, you can signify by uh, raising of hand before we end the meeting. If you want to say something, you can signify by raising up of hand. I wanted to ask what, how one will react if you, you encounter a snake, you know, all of a sudden. Do you, do you kill it immediately or you want to um, arrest it in a way? And how do you do that? That's what I just wanted to ask. Now, what, what is going to happen is the majority of the times we're going to meet snakes outside. The fact that we ran into them means that they didn't have time to retract. They know we're coming. They feel the vibration. They can probably smell us approaching as well, which means they just didn't have enough time because they're not as fast as we would think to move away in a smaller den so we wouldn't even know they're there. If you do run into a snake, I would please, please, please suggest just do not approach the animal. We're talking about at least three meters or so and just either go around it with a big half a circle or just go back. Again, that snake is just trapped in a negative situation that it doesn't want to be in. We're experiencing similar things in Europe with brown bears. Very often the interaction with a brown bear is pure coincidence and a mistake. The animal wasn't expecting you there. And how we react is often how the animal we predictably react. If we leave the animal alone and we go backwards, the bear should go there. And it's very similar to snakes, especially when you think about it. They are quite 
small, at least in, in what width compared to us. The one problem that of course always comes with it is what if a snake is in my house? What if a snake is living near me? <laughs> exactly, that is a big, big problem, isn't it? Again, I would always, always encourage prevention. If possible, is it a way that when you're building anything to make sure that this house, this farm isn't something that is calling the snakes in? Because they're going to go for a couple of reasons. They're either going to go into settlements because they're looking for food, which means what do you have there that is available to, let's say, rodents and birds? potential prey of these animals and can you minimize it because if there is no food incentive there's also no real reason for a snake to, to going towards us the other one is can you build anything part of your house part of your state that is not snake inviting remember they seek narrow spaces because they allow them safety they evolved the, uh, they evolve for millions of years to not have legs so they can slowly crawl into these spaces and feel safe, which means the more of these spaces are around your house or outside of it, the more there is a chance that the snake will try to utilize them. Because again, living space is a living space. And again, if I am going for very uh, guard-like system, there are certain species of farm animals that do like to eat snakes or do like to alert you about their presence. So in your house, it's a cat. They're incredibly reactive animals. They're much, they're usually faster than a snake when it comes to the reaction and can help you figure out that one is there and also sometimes eat it and also chase it away. The other one is in the far, on the farm, chickens are brilliant with smaller snakes. They will eat smaller snakes uh and um pigs as well so quite a few animals like that so again a natural protection against certain species again certain species certain sizes uh, but the idea is you're trying to make anything you want snake free as boring and uninteresting as possible no hideouts no food incentive maybe not even anything to do with oh this is very hot so the animal will want to be here because it's trying to hide in a warm place to get warmer. So, but again, every situation different. Uh, <laughs> but just a generic, please, 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 please don't don't work, don't approach wild snakes if you don't have to, uh, which I don't see a situation why you would. Because again, I have been working with them my entire career, and I would not walk towards a snake. I don't know. I, I do not I do not want to do that because I am I respect its place in the wild and the fact that it doesn't know me it shouldn't uh, listen to what I'm saying or how I want to pick it up and move it around uh, so it wouldn't understand that my intentions might be good um, and uh, me trying to move it off the road so uh, I wouldn't be picking that snake up or touching it. Uh, thank you so much, Azim. Uh, you gave a lot of information on snakes. I wrote a lot of things down. So that at least I know a lot of things about snake now in just one day. There you go. I am very happy to hear that. That's <laughs> Thank today's so mission. Much. We're just trying to give more info. Yeah. Can I just yeah. say something just briefly? Yeah. Okay. I, I would uh, appreciate if the participants here, at least what you have learned, what has changed in your perception of snake, it will be good for us to have you post few uh, comments or few sentences about it online. So at least we can reach out to other people. And please don't forget to tag Azim and also don't forget to tag the Animal Welfare Group Nigeria. Uh, if you, you can join Animal Welfare Group Nigeria on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at AWGN14. AWGN in capital letter and 14 in a number. Then uh, you can also follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook. Uh, our LinkedIn name and Facebook name is Animal Welfare Group Nigeria. And you can also watch our, uh, the past presentations on our YouTube channels. So we have a lot of presentations, more than, uh, more than 30. I think we have like 21 on our, on our YouTube channel now.